Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Ankuma, and I'm chair of the Department of Modern Languages, Communication, and Philosophy. And I'd like to welcome you <clears throat> to this interdisciplinary seminar series, which started about 10 years ago and has been going on. Today, we have the convener of this uh, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary series himself, Dr. Indy, to give a talk on JW, or John Woman, the uncanonized saint of abol abolitionism 50 years after. Most of us may be familiar with the names of William Lloyd Garrison or Frederick Douglass or Lydia Maria Child, considered abolitionists, but we may not be familiar with John Woman, he was actually born October 19, 1720 and died October 7th, 1772. So today is the 250th anniversary of his day. And we are in to learn a whole lot about this unsung hero of the abolitionist movement who was also a Quaker. The, <clears throat> this is also a good time to take the opportunity to Thank all of you who have sponsored uh, this seminar series for the past 10 years. We want to recognize the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Stigi University Faculty Senate, National Park Service, College of Arts and Sciences, the College of Agriculture, Environment and Nutritional Science, and the Department of Modern Languages, Communication and Philosophy. We also want to extend gratitude to the office of the provost, the deans, offices, and the faculty who have been willing to participate in their research on this plus platform. Also recognize the 10 person strong seminar series committee members who have worked very hard to put these together and all the students who have taken time and the general public to attend these series. I will now call on Ms. Amari Johnson, a senior communication major from Alex City, Alabama, who would introduce our speaker. Ms. Johnson is a film and TV nerd, and since she was a child, and she has been watching footages of behind the scene footages of how movies and films are put together. She looks forward to working in the entertainment industry one of these days. So, Amari, I hand over to you to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Dr. Ankuma. So I would like to seize this opportunity to introduce today's speaker, who no one else but our own, Dr. Indy. Dr. Bill F. Indy is a professor in the Department of Modern Languages, Communication, and Philosophy. Prior to joining Tuskegee University, Dr. Indy has held teaching positions in various universities in France, Australia, and elsewhere. He served as a professor of languages at the Academy of Paris and Academy of Versailles, France. Dr. Indy earned his dual PhD in May 2001 in languages, literatures, and contemporary civilizations, translation from the University of saint Francois, Paris, France. His scholarship has been characterized by creativity, teaching, service, research, and extensive record of publication accomplishment. Dr. Indy has published scores of articles and books, over 40. His last scholarly books are Living Independence, Critical Perspectives on Global Interdependence, The Repressed Express, and Secrets, Silences, and Betrayals. And his latest head of works are Environmental Friction, La Legofie de Poet, Peace Mongers at War, Barb Forest, La Fosse de Chemin, Noir Unoisi, and Pride Aside and Other Poets. His latest work in translation is the Journal of John Banks. He has just recently finished the translation of the Journal of John Woolman, upon which I believe his talk today is based. In 2015, he was engaged in two different NEH-funded research programs, the critical reappraisal of Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee University, and what is gained in translation at Kent State University. 
In 2017, Dr. Eni collaborated with the Southeastern Regional Seminar on African Studies, a federally funded body, Auburn University Department of History, and Auburn University Department of Africana Studies, and brought this prestigious conference to Tuskegee University in the fall of 2017. As a true multidisciplinary scholar and team player, Dr. Indy has collaborated and still collaborates with scholars in French, Austrian, Spanish, African, American, British, Canadian, Indian, and Australian universities. He has published in the areas of literature, history, Quaker studies, clinical psychology, poetry, drama, linguistics, translation, as well as history of ideas and mentalities. His scholarship covers a large variety of fields and research topics, including memory studies, globalization in the media, popular culture, autobiography, religion, literary theory, creative writing, society, politics, alterity, and native peoples. To cap it all, Dr. Indy is both a true multidisciplinary and global scholar who brings to Tuskegee University the much desired scholarship that continues to place this institution on the global educational map of the 21st century. He is the governor of the Tuskegee University's interdisciplinary seminar series. Thus, I enjoin you to welcome our speaker for today. Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, I would like to welcome everybody on the call. Thanking you for dedicating this time for us to commemorate the life of an individual who left his mark on this planet and 250 after the ideals for which he stood we still struggle with. As Ms. Johnson rightly mentioned, I should say thank you for the generous introduction. And um, you mentioned in your introduction that I just finished translating the journal of John Wood. Yes, it is being released today. That translation into French is a modest contribution and recognition of the work John Woolman did. And I think the only way to pay tribute to such a person is to widen the readership or to make available his ideals to a broader public. And you are here to listen to me talk about John Woolman. There are a number of things I would like to point out. Um, I would just clarify why John Woolman deserves a special seat amongst the saints of abolitionism. And to do this, I would like to answer five questions, five very simple questions. There would be room for Q&A. And I would like to say, I'm not going to go in detail, mentioning every little thing because we'll spend the whole day and the next week talking just about John Woolman. What I'd like you to take home is to John Woolman is, what he accomplished, his message, and why should we be talking about John Woolman exactly 250 years after his death? Also, we might, I would hint on why John Woolman matters in the 21st century. So for status, John Woolman, in his own words, tells the reader of his birth in, North, in Northampton, New Jersey, and his early acquaintance with the divine operation of divine law. The divine law, this divine love rather, would lead John Woolman to struggle for equality amongst men 
And this struggle for equality amongst men is something we still struggle with in the world today. It is not uncommon to hear of white supremacists or people who believe they are superior to others. And John Woolman tells us, I was born in Northampton in Burlington County, West Jersey in the year 1720. And goes on to telling us before I was seven years old, I began to be acquainted with patients of divine love. Through the care of my parents, I was taught to read nearly as soon as I was capable of it. And as I went from school one day, I remember that while my companions were playing by the way, went forward out and sitting down, I read the 22nd chapter of Revelation. That's in the Bible. And this is what he read. He showed me a pure river of water of life clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. In reading it, my mind, John Woolman says, was drawn to after that pure habitation, which I then believed God had prepared for his servants. The place where I sat and the sweetness that attended my mind remained fresh in my memory. This and the like gracious visitations had such an effect upon me that when boys used which it troubled me and through the continued mercies of God, I was preserved from it. It was the result, it was as a result of this injunction from divine love that Woolman felt early on in life to make the fight against slavery his lifelong pursuit. John Woolman made a conscious and rational decision as an adult to persuade slaveholders to adopt his position. He understood that this would be a daunting task and he chose to proceed intelligently by convincing just one individual after another. As such, Woolman distinguished himself as a man in the course of humanity. What did he do? He traveled mostly on foot and occasionally on horseback without money, okay? And was very useful so that he could be useful to poor people and enslaved Blacks. I must note here that John Woolman hated slavery with a passion. And having been employed as a clerk, John Woolman was to write a bill of sale for a slave woman. And he did it and regretted it as soon as he did it. And addressed his boss or his master and the buyer of the slave that holding slaves were inconsistent with Christianity. This is what John Woolman tells us in his own word. He says, the thing was sudden and though I felt uneasy at the thoughts of writing an instrument of slavery, for, the one, for one of my fellow creatures. Yet I remember that I was hired by the year and that I, it was my master who directed me to do it. And that it was an elderly man, a member of our society, that's the Society of Friends or the Quaker movement who bought her. So through weakness, I weighed and wrote it. But at the executing of it, I was so afraid in my mind that I said before my master and a friend that I believed slave keeping 
to be a practice inconsistent with Christian religion. From that time on, he set out, as I mentioned on food, to most pack, um, uh, to most Quaker slave holding plantations in all the colonies. He didn't spare any of the 13 colonies to preach against the, the shameless exploitation of Africans in the name of slavery the mistreatment Indians suffered in the hands of the colonists with his message having its desired effect. He wrote this to some of his converts. He said, I have been informed that there is a large number of Quakers in your parts who have no slaves and intended and most affectionate love, I beseech you to keep clear from purchasing any. Look, my dear friends, to divine providence and follow simplicity, that, ex that exercise of body, that plainness and frugality, which true wisdom leads to, so may you be preserved from those dangers which attend such a aiming at outward ease and greatness. Woolman encouraged Quakers, Quakers owners to free their slaves and warned against the impending consequences of such practice. And to this, of, um, the Quaker scholars, the great Quaker scholar John Whittier Greenfield has this to say of Woolman, that to those who judge by outward appearances, uh, nothing is more difficult of explanation than the strength of moral influence often exerted by obscure and uneventful lives. He goes on to telling us that some great reforms which lift the world to a higher level, some mighty change for which the ages might have waited in anxious expectancy takes place before our own eyes. And in seeking to trace it back to its origin, we are often surprised to find the initial in the chain of causes to be uh, some comparatively obscure individual. The divine commission and significance of whose life was scarcely understood by his contemporaries and perhaps not even by himself. So the above reference actually warrants me to quest what Woolman's real accomplishments were. In his journal, John Woolman tells the reader how he went about persuading Quakers at the time to abandon slavery as an institution. He was remarkably effective as a persuading, at persuading the Quakers against slavery. In one situation, he admits having for some years before served as an executor of the will of a will and disposed of a service of a Negro boy. He had himself derived no pecuniary benefit from. The story here John Woolman is telling us is a situation where in trying to convince a Quaker slaveholder to relinquish his slaves, the, sla the slaveholder claimed that the, this Negro boy still had four and a half years of service to do for him before he could get his freedom. And John Woolman decided to serve as an executor paying off for the four and a half years and letting the young man go free. So with such practice, actually within a very short time, 
the practice of slavery ceased amongst friends. And it is no doubt that the Quaker scholar Whittier, again, Greenfield, has this to say. He points out that the abolition of slavery, which was then in process throughout the world, furnishes one of the most striking illustration of an obscure individual being at the origin of great change. He talks about the far reaching and moral, social and political revolution, which Woolman undertook in undoing the evil work of centuries. And this is owed to his impulse to life and levels of him just being a poor, unlearned man, working man out of New Jersey. He was not in his time even known outside the circle of Quakers he belonged to. So we could talk about his accomplishment looking at abolitionism, but I want to draw attention to the fact that his accomplishment went beyond, way beyond abolitionism. His, his accomplishment touched on his influences on great names in literature that I would bet most of my peers on this call would be hearing for the first time that people just like Charles Lamb, Bernard Barton, Edward Irvin, Goethe, William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, they were all influenced one way or the other by Goethe. And somebody like Irvin notes, our friends, um, to a sermon of his friend, he, he talks about Woolman in these terms, that John Woolman is a perfect germ. Goethe says in German, he is a Sean seal, which means a beautiful soul. An illiterate tailor who writes in a style of the most exquisite and uh, most exquisite purity and grace and goes on to telling us that had Woolman not be so very humble, he would have written a still better book for fearing to indulge in vanity. He conceals the events in which he was a great actor. I would like you to take home that Woolman had one religion, that religion was love take home that his whole existence and all of his passion were love. If one could venture to impute to his creed and not to his personal character, the delightful frame of mind he exhibited, one could not hesitate to be a convert. His Christianity is the most inviting, it is fascinating. Other literary critic says, Woolman's gift is love, a charity which it does not enter into the natural heart of to conceive and of which the more ordinary experience, even of renewed nature, give but a faint shadow. This is amongst all of what I've just said, is almost like an invitation for me to tell you a little bit about why Woolman is a news for the individual. Though his name might be unfamiliar, his deeds 
or ideals never cease to marvel. His journal is a timely reminder of some of the events in contemporary United States of America, specifically and the world at large. His human impact is far reaching. His relevance and human interest are topical to contemporary ongoings in the world today. The rarity of his passion and love for equality amongst men. 250 years after his death remains a puzzle. It is a puzzle with which we are still grappling because if any of us on this call should pretend that the US is an egalitarian society, I'm sure John Woolman will be remiss to say no, the egalitarianism I strove for is not yet in this country. In short, Woolman's extraordinariness effaces his obscurantism as a person. And that only because he had embraced the Quaker principle of humility, which and remains the hallmark of the Quaker practice. In his journal, Woolman anticipates the civil rights movement. And he also anticipates that which we call today commonly CT. I would like you to listen to his warnings to those who engage in the shameless exploitation of enslaved Africans and theft from Indians while pursuing the accumulation of worldly treasures, which treasures collected, he says, will prove to be dangerous to their children and their children's children yet unborn. So Woolman, to this regard, writes, where people let loose minds after the love of outward things and are more engaged in pursuing the profits and seeking the friendships of the world than to be inwardly the ways of true peace. They walk in vain shadow while the true comfort of life is wanting their examples are often hurtful to others and their treasures thus collected do many times prove dangerous snares to their children. He goes on to telling those slaveholders, wisely consider the force of your example and much how your successors be thereby affected. He doesn't stop there. He points out what joy you could derive from an honest and earnest earning. He tells his readers, treasures, though small, attained on true principle of virtue are sweet. And while we walk in the light of the Lord, there is true comfort and satisfaction in the possession, neither the murmurs of an oppressed people, nor a throbbing uneasy conscience, nor anxious thought about the events of things would hinder the enjoyment of them. He is simply stating that the pleasure of such treasures that people come by following the virtues, following principles of true virtue does not bring about any pain or any discomfort, any uneasiness of thought, you can in, enjoy them freely. So this is part of the message. However, his loudest message was his cry of compassion for Native Americans and African slaves. And this is the most dynamic part of his journal. He believed 
that American Indians and the African slaves needed to be seen and treated as equal and fairly. To him, there was no question that they should treat the Indians and the African slaves any differently that were to be treated equally. And he goes on to warning that where slaves are purchased to do our labor, new difficulties attend it. And he goes on to point it that to rational creatures, bondage is uneasy and frequently occasions sourness and discontent in them, which affects family and such as claim the mastery over them. Thus, people and their children are many times encompassed with vexations, which arise from their applying to wrong methods to get a living. The commentator of Woolman has this to say about the man who in all about Woolman, he says, Wool, the man, Woolman, in all the centuries since the advent of Christ is one who lived nearest to divine pattern. And we could go on talking about what Woolman states himself. In a letter to his friends, he says, dear friends and brethren, as you are improving a wilderness and may be numbered amongst the first planters in one part of a province, I beseech you in the love of Jesus Christ wisely to consider the force of your examples and think how much your successes might be thereby affected. It is a help in a country, yeah, and a great favor and blessing when customs first are agreeable to sound wisdom, but when they are otherwise, the effect of them is grievous and children feel themselves encompassed with difficulties prepared for them by their predecessors. I would pause here for one minute and say, think about what Woolman is telling us here and think about the argument that we hear every day. We shouldn't discuss the horrors of slavery. We shouldn't discuss the horrors of uh, subjugation, discrimination, because it hurts some people. But Woolman had been warning that, look, this is something the predecessors were doing that will come back to bite them. So Woolman further goes on to challenging the apostles of enslavement through a series of thought provoking questions. I would read out some of his questions that he asked when trying to convince slaveholders. He says, do we feel an affectionate regard to posterity? Are you thinking about the future? Are we employed to promote their happiness? Do you think what you are doing, is it promoting their happiness or their discontent in the future? Do our minds and things outward look beyond our own dissolution? That is, are we considering the fact that one day we will die, leave this world for others to take over? He goes on and asks, and are we contriving for the posterity of our children after us. Let us then, like wise builders, lay the foundation deep and by our constant uniform regard to an inward piety and virtue, let them see that we really value it. And continues to telling us let us labor in the fear of the law, that their innocent minds, while young and tender, may be preserved from corruptions, that as they advance in age, 
they may rightly understand their true interest, may consider the uncertainty of temporal things, and above all, have their hope and confidence firmly settled in the blessing of the almighty being who inhabits eternity and preserves and supports the world. Now, why does John Woolman matter in the 21st century? Let's address this question. Evoking and honoring John Woolman 250 years after his death is just for me as a scholar or an academic to point out to the fact that an idealist may die, but his ideal will never die. In the 21st century, we note the resurgence of white supremacist movements around the world and very close to home in the US for the past five or, five or six years, we have been dealing with a lot of white supremacist movement. And the question I ask is, did Woolman not use the Bible to shut down any nonsense talk about racial superiority? In the 21st century, we might think slavery is far from over, but I say no, because we have all heard tales of child trafficking, sex slavery, slave labor all around the world. And I go on to saying, lest we forget the horrors of the transatlantic slave, are the pro-slavery arguments with which women deal not eerily identical to that held by the anti-Black proponents. Don't we have those who believe the rights of people in this country, especially those rights people have enjoyed for a century or half a century? We have witnessed it and we should talk about it. Again, isn't it obvious that in modern day America, systemic racism prevails? These are questions. Furthermore, when we did, it is just like when we're dealing with African American lives in this country, many on this call would have heard many a time the argument that, well, I didn't know anybody, I didn't know anybody who enslaved another. Uh, all the same, African Americans, they are here. Well, I challenge you to thinking of somebody taking you, forcing you out of your natural habitat and throwing you in an island without walls and telling you, well, you are free. And is that any different from a prison with walls? I don't know. However, what John Woolman did, he was very clear. Any such argument of telling people how Africans did not live well in their country, okay, is nonsense talk. He goes on to challenging the slave owners in this term. I'll, the quotation is slightly long, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it. He says, and they are human creatures whose souls are as precious as ours and who may receive the same help and comfort from the Holy Scriptures as we do. We could not omit suitable endeavors to instruct them therein, but that while we manifest by our conduct that our in purchasing them are to advance ourselves and while our buying captives taken in war animates those parties to push on the war and increase desolation amongst them to say they live unhappily in Africa is far from being an argument in our favor. I further said the present circumstance of these provinces to me appear difficult. The slaves look like 
a burdensome stone to such as burden themselves with them. And that if the white people retain a resolution to prefer their outward prospects to, of gain to all other considerations and do not act conscientiously towards the slaves as fellow creatures, I believe that burden will grow heavier and heavier until times change in a way that will be disagreeable to us. So we realize that even in contemporary America, Blacks, to say the least, are victims of the same, ki some kinds of stereotypes that they faced in the plantations. Blacks might be considered lazy, but John Woolman explained to his peers that you can call these people lazy after forcing them out of their continent, out of their country, and you're forcing them to work, to do work that doesn't benefit them. Every rational mind would want to benefit from his or her labor. So it is but natural that these people who are under pressure to do work that they benefit nothing from should decide not to do it or should be lazy. So in his journal, John Woolman points out at every juncture, the inconsistency of slaveholding with any fellowship with Christ and Christian principle. Um, to this point, I would like to leave all on the call so that I can give room for question and answer. I would like to leave you, but with a question from all what you, you've heard, how can we all dub or call John Woolman, who was a poor man whose love for truth far exceeded that for money as the uncanonized saint for abolitionism? Isn't it because of him that to this day, we might not that we do not have slavery as it was practiced, even if slavery is creeping back in our society in various forms. I would pause right there. So in the interest of time, so that we can have questions. If there are questions, I will take them. Either you're dropping the questions uh, in the chat or you, you take the floor and ask your questions. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. This is um, just a teaser I'm giving you. And for those who might want to read the journal of John Woolman, it is available online. It is free. It is available on audiobook. You can read it and learn a lot more from what Woolman stood for, what the Quakers have fought for relentlessly and are still fighting for around the world. Thank you. I did see a hand by, um, yeah, Mr. Gibson. Yes, what is your favorite quote by, or idea by John Woolman? All right, John Woolman has just so many things you could talk about. John Woolman's simplest or favorite thing is love is the first motion. Okay, love is the first motion. That's just very succinct, very short. Love is the first motion. His idea and ideal was the fact that if by chance, he refused categorically to benefit or to have anything to do with the benefit of slave labor. Meaning if he spent time at a person's place and realized the person hid a slave or had a slave 
And he realized that what he had benefited from that person was the result of a slave level. He would make sure he pays the slave directly. Did that answer your question, Mr. Gibson? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Let me see if somebody sent me a chat with a question. Nope. I have a question. Okay. Tell so me. I remember you mentioning um, like in, in your in your uh, critical reading and writing class, I remember you mentioning that you always saying good morning is a spiritual thing. And John Woodland seems to have a very big effect on just like a lot of your views. It seems as if like you stand greatly for what he stood for. And I was just curious, did that come from him? Like the good morning thing? Is that like something of his... Uh, all right. The yeah. good thing, thing is the Bible tells you that joy comes in the morning. All right. A pain and sorrow may last the whole night, but joy comes in the morning. So when I come to class, I bring you joy. I don't bring you sadness. Why should I greet you any other thing other than good morning? I'm greeting you good morning because I'm bringing you joy. That's why I say good morning. Does that answer your question? I know you've been dying to ask this question. You kept asking from the very first day in class. This is why I say good morning. I'm glad you answered that, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions? I have a question, Professor. Yes, go right ahead, Professor Isunga. Thank you. So first of all, great, great, great presentation. Teaches many of us uh, a lot of things. I'm among those who um, never heard many of the things that you just mentioned. So I'm glad that I'm learning these. Um, I'm just wondering about the Quakers and someone like John Woolman. Was there always someone who condemned slavery? Or did he at some point, you know, realize maybe it was not human, humanitarian to, to, um, to concur, to agree with slavery? Was I'm just, I, I don't know. All right, I get your question. And I would just like to say this, that Quakers were at the forefront of um, the protest against slavery. Remember in 16... 88, the king of France, Louis XIV, he came out with his edict, which they called the Côte Noire, which dehumanized the black man and talking about uh, blacks not having soul, treating them uh, less than uh, humans or less than objects or even animals. Now, in 1688, a number of German town um, Quakers wrote the first protest against slavery in that year and challenged all the Quakers who might have been benefiting, like others who joined the bandwagon. You know, it is like today in America, white people who actually understand that white privilege exists, all right? But they don't see, they don't have any qualms or any problem benefiting from it or trying to, to say it doesn't exist. But the, the Germantown Quakers protested against slavery from that very get go and requested their treatment. That letter of protest, I had translated it many, many years ago, about 20 years ago. It is published in France by Présence Africaine, and that speaks to the Quakers whose cardinal principle from the very get-go was equality amongst men, justice and fairness to all without discrimination. So they had, from the very beginning, 
even the, the founder of their movement, George Fox, in the 17, 16, um, 1676, earlier than past protest in 1676, visited uh, the Caribbeans and through all the island, he admonished all the slaveholders and told them how bad it was to keep slaves. So maybe this clarifies the question you're asking. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? So it seems that Woolman's and um, the Quakers were largely opposed to slavery based on their Christianity. What were the opinions of fellow uh, Christian denominations about slavery? All right. Let me, let me give you uh, a very simple example. Um, before we even go there, Quakers were the only religion and remains the only religion on both sides of the Atlantic where laws were voted against. They had laws that were voted against Quakers. Even if we had moved from that period, those laws were never abrogated. Now, Quakers did not have any problem um, fellowshipping with their fellow Christians. And that is why the state of Pennsylvania, which was founded by Quakers, tolerated every other denomination. Way back 17, 18, 19, 20th and 21st century, it was a state in which every other denomination could freely leave. And I would um, even push the button a little further because for the benefit of those of you who are still on the call, when you read the US constitution, please think about Quaker contribution to, the, to this country. Because when the founding fathers fought the revolution, they did not understand how they would bring together 13 states with different religions. And the Quakers in Pennsylvania told them, we have a blueprint in our states. Every religion coexists peacefully. That's why the constitution of the US was drawn in Philadelphia because the Quakers had already drawn up a constitution for religious peaceful coexistence. And as a result, the founding fathers thought it would be nice to follow those principles. And that is why in your constitution, you find the freedom of religion and freedom of assembly, which is something the Quakers strongly believed in. The Quakers were persecuted. They didn't want them to assemble. They didn't want them to do anything. But when they, the, William Penn, who was influenced by John Banks to become a Quaker, when he founded the state of Pennsylvania and around Pennsylvania, New Jersey, it was mostly inhabited by Quakers, those Quakers, had to leave their imprint because they believed that Christ was in every human being and that they understood and knew Christ by experience and not just by reading the Bible. Did I answer your question, Mr. Gibson? Yes. All right, I'll welcome some more questions. Professor, yes. I can't help noticing that as Woolman considered the root of slavery to be greed, yeah. that, that the problems, and he talks about what is the legacy you will be leaving. And when we look at the mess the world is in now with climate change, yeah. It seems to me that greed is the cause for that too. Greed was the cause for enslaving people. It was the cause for colonialism. Please talk a little bit about greed and how each person can live their example that leaves a good legacy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I love the reflection 
And I am happy you drew my attention to that. In my presentation, I didn't very much point to Woolman as an environmental scientist, even though he didn't, uh, even though he did not have the, some of the education we pride ourselves in having Woolman did a whole lot to protect environment. Now to the question of greed, Woolman led his life by example, saying, I am not interested in wealth if that wealth is got ill gotten. It will not satisfy my conscience. It will not serve me. It will not serve the future generation of my children. And he goes on to telling, look, what you are relinquishing to your children is blood money. And this money, when the enslaved people will talk about it, guess what? This is, you will not be happy about it. Now, talking about greed and colonization, enslavement, they were all the product of, uh, they were all the product of greed. And that is why Woolman, as he points out, says, if you continue with this greedy attitude, what you are doing is you are creating a burden for yourself. You are creating a burden for yourself. You are creating a burden for future generation. And Woolman's ideas and ideas seem to be prophetic, as you rightly pointed out. They are coming. It is what we are living today. We see the world is turning into a place where people, we have climate denials, who tell you, no, it is not happening. Then it happens in their backyard, and they are the first to tell you, oh, it is just some mishap. Woolman tells you about making sound choices, about doing things the right way. And what I'll just suggest here is, if we were to leave life with the example of Woolman, trying to be fair and equitable to everybody, then the world would be a better place. And that is why Woolman, in his travels, would not accept the service of an enslaved person without compensation because that person is deserving of reward for his service. And if we understood the world that way, we would not get the world where we are today. We would not even have gotten to the point of colonialism. We would not have gotten to, um, we wouldn't have gotten to this point. Okay, so um, I don't know if I did address your, your, your question or your remark, but that's what I think Woolman does. Thank you, Professor. Yes, I'm quite satisfied. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for your comments. Yeah. So any other question? Well, if there are no questions, I see, I see um, it is five o'clock and I would just like to reiterate my thanks for all of you on the call, even those who've left. I thank everybody and I look forward to you picking up the Journal of John Woolman, he's not alone. There are many other journals, especially given that those books are public domain. Read them. They will change your perspective on a number of things about our country, about life, and we will understand this country better. Um, just to address my elder sister here, again, you talked about greed. I'm just thinking of what happened in the last few years 
where tax breaks were given to very rich people. And just now they're trying to help students who are indebted to see if they could be gotten out of poverty. And we have this wolf, craft wolf. Oh no, it is too much money to, to spend. The question is, who needs the tax break? Is it the students or is it the billionaires? So I'm sure Woolman will really be upset that people take, like they say in England, taking coal to Newcastle. You can take water to the ocean. You go to the ocean to fetch water, but you cannot take it. The billionaires are already rich. Why do you need to give them more money? By giving them more money, that only reinforces that idea of greed. And there should come a time when the billionaires should look at themselves and ask the question, what am I accumulating all of this for? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Have a good night. Okay, you have a blessed morning.